Awesome. Good morning. Happy Sabbath. Thank you all for joining us. Glad to see all of you. Uh, today's topic is going to be about worship. I wrestled about what the title was going to be, and I could not come up with a catchy title. So the topic is going to be worship. Maybe we'll come up with a theme as we go along. One of the things that, to get us started to think about this, in John chapter 4, Jesus is talking to the woman at the well, and in the conversation that they're having, obviously he finds, he reveals to her that he understands her marital situation, that she has had five husbands, and the husband that she's currently with is not actually her husband. And she recognizes that he's a prophet, or at least more than a prophet. And in the, in the conversation, he reveals to her that he's more than a prophet, that he's the Messiah. And then she asks him a poignant question. She says, we Samaritans worship on this mountain, and you Jews worship on that what is the difference, essentially? And he says, we, uh, you Samaritans do not know what you worship. We Jews know what we worship, for God is with the Jews. And then he goes on and says this. It's right here, John chapter 4, verse 24. says, but the hour is coming, and now is, when the, worship, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such to worship him. And I thought about it. What does it mean to worship the Lord in spirit? and in truth. What does that mean? It, it seems so cliche. There's something that is used. Earlier in the week, I was watching a video. It was very interesting. And it's a, it is the growth of the Latin mass among Catholics. And so you have the, what they call the Novus Ordo, where they do the mass in English, and everyone kind of understands it. And now it's growing to do it in Latin, where most people don't even know what it means. But what I was impressed with as I was watching the video was how many of them are looking for something that is holy. How many of them are looking for something that is unlike the world? You have these giant mega churches where everyone gets to have the smoke machines, the lights, the guitars, the drum sets, and a preacher who might preach for 20 minutes and really it's just a pep talk. And everyone goes away feeling great and dumps a ton of money in there, but yet they're empty and they're looking for something else. Case in point, one of my friends who was at the seminary with me, he told me that he was raised Adventist, and then he got into the contemporary church movement where it was all exciting, drums, loud music, everyone jumping up and down and having a wonderful time. And he said it was so empty at the end that he ended up, raised Adventist, he ended up going to a Catholic church because he wanted to be in a place where God is holy. I have a suggestion to make to all of you that we have a need within ourselves to have God be holy. Amen. And God himself Amen. requires of us Amen. to acknowledge him yeah. as holy. Amen. But before we go any further, before we delve further into scriptures, what do we need to do? We need to pray. Let us bow our heads. Gracious and heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the time that we have. We just ask for your Holy Spirit. We ask for the comforter to come upon us and hit us with power and understanding that your words will have life in them because they do have life in them. They are spirit and they are truth. Help them to come into our hearts, knock down the idols, and bring us closer to you. In Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen. Amen. So the story I want to talk about today, and this is a challenging story. Those who were on the Bible study last night will recognize it because we discussed it last night. But it is in 2 Samuel chapter 6. 2 Samuel chapter 6. And we'll be starting in verse, in verse 4. 2 Samuel chapter 6. And what's the context quickly of 2 Samuel chapter 6, actually starting in verse 5, is that the Ark of the Covenant is now going to come from Kirith Jerim to Jerusalem. This is, this is what they want to do. And I want you to understand that Everyone here is sincere. No one there is worshiping idols at this time. They really want God to enter the city. They want his presence. They want to have the ark which has been separated from them for so long to be there. And so as it is, we have David, the great, the sweet psalmist of Israel, who is composing psalms. We have people who are playing instruments, and everyone is excited about this moment. And then we start in verse 5. 2 Samuel chapter 6, verse 5. It says, Then David and all the house of Israel played music before the Lord on all kinds of instruments made of fur, 
fir wood, on harps, on stringed instruments, tambourines and sistrums, and on cymbals. I mean, you could imagine this must have been an incredible sight to see. And as everyone is excited and feeling good, what happens next? Verse 6, And when they came to Nishan's threshing floor, Uzzah put out his hand to the ark of God and took hold of it, for the oxen had stumbled. Now, we had mentioned this last night in the Bible study. Often when you read about a threshing floor, it was usually symbolic of judgment. The threshing floor is where you separated the wheat from the chaff. And what you would do is you would get a good pitchfork full of wheat and you would shake it and throw it in the air and the wind would come and blow away the chaff. And you would have to do that over and over and over and over until you had the pure grain left. And it took time and it was laborious work. But in the minds of the Hebrews, this was always something that represented the judgment of God, that God would be sifting out the hearts of men before the judgment seat. And so here they come to this point, and what happens? The oxen stumbles, and Uzzah reaches out, and he is struck dead, as it says here in verse 7. And the anger of the Lord was aroused against Uzzah, and struck him there for his error, and he died there by the ark of God. I mean, right there. Could you imagine the middle of service? We're all excited. We're praising the Lord. And then someone like me standing up here saying something, and, and I hit dead. And everyone knows it wasn't a coincidence that I really was, because there are people who are having coincidences these days. But I would hit the ground because I'm blaspheming the Lord. It would stop the service. At least I hope it would. <laughs> at least I hope that we would take a moment and say, hey, let's at least get him out of here before we continue. But the point of the matter is you could imagine that in this scene of supposed to be joy and exaltation of the Lord, this man hits the ground and they know it's from God. And then it says right here, verse 8, And then David became angry because of the Lord's outbreak against Uzzah. And he called the name of the place Perez Uzzah to this day, which means outbreak or breakthrough against Uzzah. And David was afraid of the Lord that day. And he said, How can the ark of the Lord come to me? And so David would not move, verse 10, so David would not move the ark of the Lord with him to the city of David, but took it aside to the house of Obed-Edom the Gittite. Now, interesting about this is that David first gets angry because he's like, hey, we're just here to praise the Lord. We're just here to celebrate his goodness. How can he be against what we're doing? You can imagine the consternation, the anger. Well, isn't what we're doing just good enough? Why can't you accept it? And as a matter of fact, this is often the response that we all have to this very passage. Why would God be so particular? They just wanted to worship him. Can't God understand that it's what's in here? It's all about the heart. But that belies what Jesus said to the woman at the well. What did he say? That you should bless you. That you should worship him in what? Spirit and truth. Not just spirit and not just truth. You have to have both. You have to have both. So it's not enough that you just simply feel this way. The other problem with this passage is that sometimes we wave it off and we say, well, you know, Jesus wouldn't do that. And I want you to see here that perhaps we have sold God short. Perhaps we don't realize what holiness and worship means to God. And so I want you to see this in its context. So one of the things that we find here is that Uzzah is struck dead, but why we just think that this is just a one-off. This just happened. But the context leads us to something else, and the context actually begins in 1 Samuel 4. Now, we're not going to read all 1 Samuel 4, but if I were you, I would turn to 1 Samuel chapter 6 at least, because we will be reading some of that. But in 1 Samuel 4, does anyone know what happens at 1 Samuel 4? If, if, you don't, if you don't have it already in memory, that's all right. But what happens in 1 Samuel 4 that's where Ichabod is born. And Ichabod is born in response to what? The ark being taken from Israel. There was a battle between the Philistines. And they were losing against the Philistines. They said, I know what we'll do. I know what we'll do. We'll bring the ark of the covenant out. And God will give us the victory. Because why? Because we love him. We know that he doesn't like the Philistines. We, we're better than that. And, and they went out there. And what happened? God said, this is exactly what I wanted. And it is. It is exactly what he wanted. And the priests were killed, Israel was routed, and the Ark of the Covenant was taken to the Philistines. But why did that happen? Well, the good thing is, is that they did actually march out there carrying the Ark on the post. That's truth. They actually did do that. And the priest went out there, consecrated. They did that. But what was the problem? There was no spirit. What do I mean by spirit? There was no purity. The wicked priests who were doing it were Eli 
or sorry, Hophni and Phineas, the sons of Eli. And Hophni and Phineas, what were they doing? Well, they were sleeping with the women who came to the, temp, to the tent. They were cheating on their wives, sleeping with these women. They were taking offering for themselves. They were turning the very sacrificial God into complete licentiousness and making a stench in the nostrils of God. And so what happens? God says, I'm not going to tolerate it. I don't care if you dress up in the robes the way I want you to do. I don't care if you carry the ark the way that I want you to do. If you're going to be corrupt, I am not going to accept anything that you ask. And so what happens? They were all slaughtered. Every last one of them was killed. And then what do we find next in chapter 5? What happens? The Philistines. Now, the Philistines, this is interesting. The Philistines recognized that there probably was power with the ark. But they thought that their gods had given them the victory. What they didn't realize is that the God of Israel is not a respecter of persons and that he actually allowed the Philistines to take the ark and allowed the Philistines to bring judgment on his own people. They could not conceive that. And so what do they do? They actually carry the ark on the poles and they bring it into their temple. And of course, what happens? Their God falls down. His hands get broken off. His head falls off, which shows his utter inability and the judgment of God on them. And after a plague breaks out and many of them die, they decide to send the Ark of the Covenant back, which is in 1 Samuel chapter 5. So that happens, right? And so then we get here to 1 Samuel chapter 6. So the Ark of the Covenant comes back to God's people. Now keep in mind, what we're talking about is we're talking about worship. We're talking about holiness in spirit and in truth. So we don't expect the Philistines to do that because they really don't know the truth, and therefore they really don't have the right spirit either. But nonetheless, God... God goes ahead and uh, honors their gift in giving the ark back and removes the plague from them. But when the ark comes back, what happens? Well, the people of God are very excited. They make a sacrifice uh, for the ark of the covenant. And then what do they do? What do they do? Well, go here, uh, 1 Samuel chapter 6. They decide that the ark of the covenant doesn't really mean anything. That holy doesn't mean holy. That they, if it's in their heart and they feel that it's right, they get to do what they want. And so they did. They did do what they wanted. But there was a problem. So 1 Samuel chapter 6, verse 19. Then he struck the men of Beth Shemesh because they had looked into the ark of the Lord. So think about it. They thought that, hey, we're having a nice time. We've offered sacrifices. This is a joyous occasion. What is in this thing? What's in here? Let's take a look. They take the covering off. They lift up the lid. And what happens? They're struck dead. Now, there is some debate about how many of them actually were struck dead. Because if you read the rest of the passage, it says it struck, looked into the ark, and he struck 50,070 men of the people. Uh, and the people lamented because the Lord had struck the people with a great slaughter. That's in the King James, New King James. You'll find that there. And other versions... In other, in other versions, it will say 70. It will say 70. So the, here's, the, here's the issue. The commentators have a hard time with this because this judgment seems awfully harsh. I mean, they just looked into the ark. Why do 50,000 people got to die? 50,000 and 70 people. I mean, that's way too much. There's no way that could happen. Now, there is, there is, there is some translating uh, funniness in the Hebrew that it could be translated in different ways, and some commentators argue that it was 70 people that died and that they came from a group of families, which is where they get the thousands. There's, there's something there. Like I said, other translations are just going to say 70. But either way, the point of the matter is all they did was look into it. I mean, they, they, they weren't violating the commandments, so to speak. They just looked into it and said, hey, let's go ahead and take a look. And many died. And the other issue that you find here is at the very end, uh, in the New King James and King James, it says the Lord had struck the people with a great slaughter. So was it 50,000 and 70 or was it 70? It doesn't really matter. The fact of the matter is, is that they did something they were not supposed to do. So keep this history in mind now. This history is all in mind before we get to Uzzah. So this should have been something fresh in their minds of what the Lord did. They lost the Ark of the Covenant because they refused to worship God in spirit and truth. Because of the corrupt priests, they thought they could do whatever they want. It was taken away. The Ark was then brought back. And then the people of God began to treat the Ark as a piece of furniture, opening it up. And so at least 70 were killed. At least 70 killed. And on the high end, 50,000 more. And so what happens next? They are so terrified that you read this, verse 20 of 1 Samuel chapter 6. And when the men of Beth Shemesh said... 
Who is able to stand before the holy God? And to whom shall it and to whom shall it go up from us? So in other words, they knew that there was an issue that they had to have someone who could be in the presence of God. And so what did they do? They sent messengers to the inhabitants of Kirith Jerem, saying, The Philistines have brought back the ark of the Lord. Come down and take it up with you. Then the men of Kirith Jerem came up and took the ark of the Lord and brought it in the house of Aminadab, or Abinadab, and on the hill, and consecrated Eleazar, his son, to keep the ark of the Lord. So notice this. They recognized right away that the ark isn't just some piece of furniture, that worshiping God isn't just some sort of perfunctory rite that we go about once a week. This is serious. And so the, even to the point where they consecrate Eleazar in Abinadab's, in Abinadab's house to take care of the ark of the covenant. So you can see here already the wheels are turning, that we just can't go about business as usual, that worshiping God is serious. And so with that said, for the next 20 years, if you were to go to the next part in uh, chapter, uh, chapter 7, verse 2 of 1 Samuel, we find for the next 20 years, the Ark of the Covenant is in Abinadab's house with a consecrated Eleazar taking care of it. All this time goes by, and finally, this is when David is able to come. And you ask yourself, have we learned nothing from all this? Think about it. You had people die from looking into the ark. You had priests die because they were, they were living reprobate lives. They were slaughtered for trying to bring the ark out like a, uh, like a talisman or a lucky charm against the Philistines. And now you have a man who is consecrated in his house, taking care of it. Did the people of God learn nothing? Here's another interesting point when we get back to Uzzah. We know that only God's people were to carry the ark, namely the Levites. So if you were to go to uh, Numbers chapter 4, if you were to go to Numbers chapter 4, this is what you read. Numbers chapter 4, verses 1 through 5, and it says this, Then the Lord... Uh, starting verse 1, Numbers 4, chapter 4, 1 through 5. Then the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron, saying, Take a census from the sons of Kohath among the children of Levi by their families, by their father's house. From 30 years old to, uh, and above, even to 50 years old, and all who enter the service to do the work in the tabernacle of meeting. So notice that if you were going to be serving, you were consecrated at 30 and you would go past 50 in the years of retirement and you would be a part of that. Those are the people who would be initiated in the service. They even had an age range that they wanted for people in the service. And it says in verse 4, this is the service of the sons of Kohath and the tabernacle relating to the most holy things. When the camp prepares to its journey, Aaron and his sons shall come and they shall take the cover. They shall take down the covering veil over the cover of the... Uh, Take down the covering veil, the covering veil, and cover the ark of the testimony with it. So that's what they were supposed to do. If you go down to uh, chapter, uh, same chapter, verse 15, he says this. He says, And when the sons of Aaron had finished covering the sanctuary and all the furnishings of the sanctuary, when the camp was set to go, then the sons of Koath shall come and carry them, but they shall not touch any holy thing lest they die. These are the things in the tabernacle of meeting, which the sons of Kohath are to carry, which is, includes the ark. So think about it. Out of all the priests, you have a, out of all the Levites, you have a subsection, a family, who is devoted to carrying the ark. And they, between the ages of 30 and 50, are consecrated for this very thing. And then they're told that only they are able to carry it, but never to touch it unless they die. Now, I also thought this was interesting if you go to Numbers chapter 7. Numbers chapter 7. Because this gives you more context to why God would not be pleased with them, especially when they should have known. Numbers chapter 7. So, in Numbers 7, we find that God uh, is talking to Moses, and they are initiating sacrifices for the tabernacle. The tabernacle is finished, and all the leaders of the tribes are coming together, and they are bringing sacrifices. And so what happens in verse 3? They're bringing their offerings, and it says, And they brought their offerings before the Lord, six covered carts and twelve oxen, a cart for every two of the leaders, and for every we each one an ox, and they presented them before the tabernacle. Now, what do they mean? In other words, all the tribes got together, and they brought offerings, oxen, and they brought carts. And these carts were to be given 
to the Levites. Why were they given to the Levites? So they could carry all the stuff of God. That's what they were given, all right? And so what does it say here? Verse 5. Oh, verse 4, then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Accept these things from them, that they may be used in doing all the work of the tabernacle of meeting. And you shall give them to the Levites, every man according to his service. So Moses took the carts and the oxen and gave them to the Levites. So the Levites are getting ox and ox carts, all right? They're getting oxen to sacrifice and also oxen to pull the carts, and they're getting carts, all right? So I just want you to understand that they're getting carts. I, I know I've said that a few times, <laughs> but I'm emphasizing it for this very reason. Underline. Yes, underline this, because notice what happens next. In verse, in, he goes, verse 7, ver, verse 7 and 8 talks about the, the carts being given. But now verse 9, the carts are given to the different families of the Levites. But verse 9, but to the sons of Kohath, he, Moses, gave none because theirs was the service of holy things which they carried on their shoulders. So think about it. God tells Moses, give all these carts, give all these oxes, but to the sons of Kohath, don't you dare give them a cart. They're never to think ever, ever that they are to put the ark or anything on a cart. Their job is to carry it on their shoulders. So that was already established. You see this, that they couldn't even get a cart. You, you could imagine the kids growing up to dad, why is it our cousin's family, they get a cart and we got to carry everything, son? It's a long story, but this is our job. We're here to carry this. You think about that. So here, this brings us all the way back to the story of Uzzah. They had every reason to know, every reason to know that God is to be worshipped in spirit and in truth. God is a God who is a holy God. You can't just do what you want and think, well, I'm sincere. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. There are some times that God draws a line in the sand. Yes. Is there, a time in, of, uh, in a, is there a time where we are in ignorance that God winks? Absolutely. Is there a time that he takes what we know and says, that's all right, I accept it. But there are times. There are times that God is very particular about what he wants. And how do we know this? Let's go to uh, 1 Chronicles chapter 15. 1 Chronicles 15. Hmm. 1 Chronicles 15, and this is David, after he was upset and terrified of everything that happened, he does some thinking. Three months go by, if you were to read in uh, first, uh, uh, 2 Samuel chapter 6, you don't get this time period going by, but it's at least three months of time goes by, and David has had some moments to reflect upon what happened and why Uzzah died. And so what he doesn't say is he goes, well, I just can't believe God's treating us this way. That's not what he says. Starting in verse 2, notice what he says here. He comes to this conclusion, no doubt from studying the word of God. He says this, and then David said, 1 Chronicles chapter 15, verse 2, no one may carry the ark of God but the Levites, for the Lord has chosen them to carry the ark of God and to minister before him forever. And David gathered all Israel together at Jerusalem to bring up the ark of the Lord to its place, which he prepared for it. Skipping down to verse 12. Then he said to them, to the Levites, you are the heads of your father's houses of the Levites. Sanctify yourselves and your brethren that you may bring up the ark of the Lord God of Israel to the place I have prepared for it. Just a raise of hands. How many of you before church service are praying that your heart would be ready for the service? Think about it. Right. Think about it. Because... In the, when it comes to communion particularly, Paul even tells the Corinthians that they need to do what? Examine themselves. Examine themselves. How often are we just thinking, well, I'm here. I feel good. I love God as much as the next person. I get to do what I want, right? Is that making God holy in our lives? Is that showing him the due respect that he deserves? We're doing something here that, as when we pray, may your will, uh, thy will be done on earth as it is where? In heaven. And where is it to be done on earth? In here. That's where it's to be done. So notice, they are to consecrate themselves, sanctify themselves. In verse 13, for because you did not do this the first time, the Lord our God broke out against us because we did not consult him about the proper order. 
So the priests and the Levites sanctified themselves to bring up the ark of the Lord God of Israel. And the children of the Levites bore the ark of God on their shoulders by its poles as Moses commanded them according to the word of the Lord. Now again, the problem with this is that I, invariably there's some hand waving here. And the hand waving is, the hand waving is, well, you know, that was back then. That was, just, that was back then, you know. I mean, Jesus hadn't died yet. Nah. I mean, that's really what happens. Oh, you know, New Testament, Old Testament, Old Covenant, New Covenant, death, life. I mean, whatever it is, God can't be the same, and that's what we say. We go, well, Jesus wouldn't do that. Jesus isn't like that. Are you sure? Well, there are three times that Jesus goes to the temple. Can anyone name the three times that Jesus goes to the temple in the New Testament? What's the first one? Does anyone know what the first one was? Dedication. dedication. I guess there's four then, isn't there? Yeah. There's four. So there's four. There's the dedication, and then what comes after that? When he was 12. He's teaching, right? And then what comes after that? The, the first cleansing of the temple. The first cleansing. And at the end, what does he do again? Because the first wasn't enough. He cleanses it again just before he dies. Those are the ones. So, he, so in other words, the Messiah gradually makes his way there, warning them. Uh, to those who were ready, they recognized the Messiah had come. And then he comes and teaches, and they would not listen. And then he comes and cleanses, and they still would not listen. And then he cleanses and cleanses again, and then warns them that it's going to be destroyed. But we're going to look at the first cleansing. So John chapter 2. John chapter 2, starting here in verse 13. Now the Passover of the Jews was at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. And he, found, and he found in the temple those who had sold oxen and sheep and doves and money changers doing business. And when he had made a bouquet of flowers, he brought some chocolates and said, I love you all. You're doing a great job. You're just... No, that's right. That doesn't see that, does it? That doesn't see that. No. He actually makes a whip of cords. No bouquet of flowers, no chocolates, no teddy bears, no sunshine. There's a whip of cords. And then what happens next? And he drove all of them out of the temple with the sheep and oxen, and they poured out all the changers' money and overturned the tables. Now, I, I just have to pause right here. Did they have a security team in the temple? Did they have a security team in the temple? The answer is yes. The answer is yes. Who do you think got Jesus? That was the security team. They've always had a security team. They even had a wall in the temple, and it warned Gentiles that if they walk past this wall, which is about this high, and we found it, the archaeologists have found it, it's written in uh, Greek and Latin, if you walk past this wall, and you are a Gentile, you walk past here by forfeiting your life. So they had people ready to execute justice right there. So you have to say, well, some guy comes out wearing just plain clothes, and he makes a cord of whips. If he would have been anyone else, they would have put him to death. Think about that for a moment. Had he been anyone else, they would have said, man, this crazy lunatic is going to die. But there was something about Jesus where they fled for their lives. It wasn't that he just whipped them really hard and they said, whoa, I don't want any one of that. They had swords and they, they had spears. There was something about Jesus' countenance, about that internal divinity that comes out that scared them to an extent that they left all their money behind. They didn't even bother to take it. It was that bad. So when we read this, we have to understand that it wasn't the whip. But the point of the matter is, is that what is he doing? He's trying to purge them of this evil. And then it says, and then in verse 16, it says, And he said to all those who uh, sold doves, Take these things away. Do not make my father's house a house of merchandise. Verse 17, And his disciples remembered that it was written, The zeal for your father's house, the zeal for your house, has eaten me up. Now, what were they doing in the temple? Now, the, what they did was actually not a bad service at the time when they first did it. So people would come from around the world and they would travel to Jerusalem and trying to keep doves and trying to keep a lamb alive for a journey that could take months was difficult. And sometimes you could only travel very light. If you were poor, you could only travel very light, so it would be difficult to do to bring a lamb that type of journey. The lamb could get sick, someone could steal it, someone would eat it. It doesn't matter, so it would be very tough. So what they did is they said, hey, we have a service here. If you come here and you want to make a sacrifice, we have doves and we have lambs that have all been inspected by the priests. They're USDA certified, <laughs> which doesn't mean it. So they went ahead, they went ahead and looked at them and they said, this is what we're going to do. So you can come here and you can purchase a lamb, a dove, or whatever you need to make a sacrifice, which sounds like a fair and reasonable thing to do, considering the difficulties of traveling. But what did they do? They said, hmm, we can make a little money off of this. So you would show up with your gold coins, you'd show up with your gold coins and say, I'm ready to buy a lamb. And you would put your gold coin down and they'd say, oh, that, 
that, that has Caesar's face on it. We can't, we can't put that in the temple. That's corrupt. And you go, really? You can't accept gold? Well, we can, but we have to change the money to something else. So we're going to give you a temple shekel, which is essentially a worthless token, anywhere else in the world. So you, they would say, here's a gold coin, and they would give you, they would give you a bronze shekel. And they say, okay, now you can buy a lamb. So you think about it, if you're trading bronze or you're trading gold for bronze, you're losing on that exchange. And that's how they began to rack up the money. And soon, one gold coin didn't equal one bronze token. Soon you would need, you would need three gold coins for one bronze token. And before you long, people are like, well, what's going on here? You're exploiting us. So you can imagine why Jesus would be angry. You could imagine that the, that the place of worship that bore his name made him angry. Read in the New Testament, outside of the cleansing of the, tap, the sanctuary, both here and later on in his ministry, you don't find him getting angry. You don't find him making a whip of cords. But when it comes to worship, Jesus is angry. And the very verse that he cites, or the very verse that is quoted that his disciples remember, is Psalm 69, verse 9. And it says here, and I, I like the way it's rendered in the NIV, it says here, the zeal for your, for your house consumes me. This idea that it burns me up. It makes me that angry. The zeal of your house consumes me. For, and, th and the insults of those who insult you fall on me. So those who insult the Father are insulting the Son. Those who insult the Son insult the Father. That's just the way it's going to work. And you could see the anger here because they're taking the things of God which are to be a blessing to the world. And what are they doing? They're making a stench and evil. And so you can see why he would do it. This is the same Jesus who would have, who would have looked at this, the, the sentence pronounced against Uzzah and said, yes, that is my sentence too. That is my sentence too. Let's go to the second cleansing of the temple. So let's go to Mark. It's in, it's in Matthew Mark and Luke, but I prefer it in Mark. There's just some details there. Mark chapter 11. Mark 11, starting in verse 15, and it says this, So they came to Jerusalem, and Jesus went to, into the temple and began to drive out those who bought and sold in the temple and overturned the tables of money changers and the seats of those who sold doves. Sounds very similar to what we have there because they didn't learn the first time. And he would not allow anyone to carry the wares through the temple. And then he taught them, saying, Is it, is not, is it not written, My house shall be called a house of a prayer for all nations, but you have made it a den of thieves. And then the scribes and chief priests heard it and sought how they might destroy him, for they feared him because all the people were astonished at his teaching. Now, in other, in other I believe in Luke and in Matthew, it talks about the people coming in and worshiping and praising God. They were very upset about that, saying that he's the son of David. They were very upset. But here's the thing. He, they didn't learn the first time, so here he is overthrowing it again. Now, He's actually quoting two passages here. He's quoting two passages here, both referring to the temple. The first one is one that every Adventist should recognize because it's in Isaiah 56. The first one is in Isaiah 56, and it's actually in verse 7. Now, if anyone remembers the context of Isaiah 56, is that in Isaiah 56, it is the, it is the psalm, or sorry, not, it is the prophecy to the Gentiles. You have the, you have the sin-bearing servant in Isaiah 53, you have the announcement of the gospel, the light going to the Gentiles in 51, and then you're building the crescendo to Isaiah 56 and 58, dealing with the mission going out to the Gentiles, the light going to the Gentiles. And so in 56, which talks about those who are uh, eunuchs, those who are not of the house of Israel, that they can come to his house if they keep the Sabbath. He, he says all that, if they do that, they will be welcomed. And so in Isaiah 56, verse 7, Jesus is quoting this. And he says this, Even them I will bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices will be accepted on my altar. For my house shall be called a house of prayer for all nations. So that's the promise. That's what the temple should have been. That's, it was to be a blessing to everyone. But notice because of their lust for money, their lust for power, the, 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 their unwillingness to do what God has said, they had made it corrupt. The second passage which he quotes, the den of thieves, comes from Jeremiah 7, verse 11. 
And in, the, in Jeremiah 7, the, the context is, is that God's people are doing whatever they want. They're worshiping idols. They are engaged in all sorts of corruption. And God is trying to bring them back, and he's letting them know that if they continue in this, their house will be destroyed. And so he says this, Has this house, this is Isaiah, uh, Jeremiah 7 verse 11, Has this house, which is called by my name, become a den of thieves in your eyes? Behold, I have seen it, says the Lord. In other words, he knows it's a den of thieves. And so in this passage, when Jesus cites this, My house shall be a house of prayer for all nations, but it has become a den of thieves. What is he saying? That the original blessing, the original blessing was to be to the whole world, to welcome the whole world to worship God in spirit and in truth. But because you didn't do this, it is now made a den of thieves, and now it is set aside for destruction. Did that happen? It certainly did. This is the seriousness of worship. Right there, he's letting them know, and this is why they would have been upset. He's letting them know it would all come, be done away with. It would all be destroyed. But again, is the issue of worship done now that the New Testament is over? No, it's absolutely not. It's absolutely not. In the book of Revelation, does anyone know how many times the word worship is used in the book of Revelation? Any, any guesses? 22 times. Almost one per chapter. 22 times in the book of Revelation the word worship is used. And as a matter of fact, what distinguishes the righteous and the unrighteous, while it is the commandments of God, one of the key factors is worship. Worship. In other words, this issue isn't going away. This isn't going to just be dissolved anytime soon. The real issue that's going to divide the wheats and the tares, the goats from the sheep, is going to be whether or not we worship him in spirit and in truth. Listen to what it says here in Revelation chapter, well, I'll read two of them. We know this one, Revelation 14, 7. Many of us know that one. And he came saying with a loud voice, fear God and... I fear God to give glory to him for the hour of his judgment has come and worship him who made the heaven, the earth, the sea, and the springs of water. That's one of the main issues there. And again, between Revelation uh, 13 and 14, the word worship is used at least five times in that. And there's a battle between who is going to worship the beast and his image and who is going to worship the creator who has made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and the water, and uh, the, the sea and the water that are under the earth. That's the issue. But notice this in Revelation chapter 20. Revelation chapter 20. Notice the dividing line here. Once again. Revelation 20. Starting in, starting in verse 4. And I saw the thrones, and they sat on them, and judgment was committed to them. And I saw the souls, who, the, the, I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their witness to Jesus, and for the word of God, who had not worshipped the beast or his image, and had not received the mark on their foreheads or on their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. Powerful. Notice that these are the people who give their life for God, and what is it they don't do? They do not worship the beast. They do not receive the mark on their forehead, on their hand. These are they that are going to reign with Christ for a thousand years. And if the dividing line is worship, shouldn't we seek to worship God in spirit and truth? Notice what it says here in verse 5, but the rest of the dead did not live again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Verse 6, blessed, blessed and holy is he who has part in the first resurrection over such the second death has no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him for a thousand years. Friends, when you read the book of Revelation, Revelation is all about worship. Some of the most powerful scenes in the book of Revelation are Revelation 4 and 5, where we have the four living creatures and the 24 elders worshiping God, saying, Holy, Holy Lord, God Almighty, who was and is to come. We have in the chapter 6, where we have the Lamb who receives this, the seven-sealed scroll, and it is said of Him that He is worthy to receive praise, glory, and honor. This whole thing is about who are we going to worship, and not just who, but whether or not we're going to worship Him in spirit and in truth. When it comes to this, we need to ask Him like David did. We need to inquire as David did, is this what God would have us do? Is this the type of consecration and holiness that God would have us do? Because as I mentioned at the beginning, the world is looking for a holy place. The world is looking for something different, something holy, something set apart. And we're either going to be there to point them to our Father who is in heaven, 
who is holy and, uh, and harmless and undefiled by sin, or we're going to join with the rest of the world. We have to ask ourselves, what is it going to be? If we were going to spend a thousand years singing the praises of God, then we may want to start practicing now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.